It's just after midnight on a late fall evening. Police Sergeant Toby Malora was responding to a report of a strange light in the night sky. Suddenly, his car mysteriously shuts down. What happened next would change his life forever. A spacecraft from another world secretly visiting the Earth. A thousand is being kidnapped by an alien species and subjected to horrifying experiments. Outrageous claims? Or could they possibly be true? Good evening, I'm Robert Davi. Tonight we'll search for confirmation, the hard evidence of an extraterrestrial visitation. We'll seek the answer to the question. Are aliens among us? Tonight, startling footage of a UFO. But is it for real? It has to be something incredible. This UFO was filmed from the space shuttle. The technology we're looking at is quantum leaps beyond anything we have on the Earth. These people say they've been abducted by aliens. They were tall, they were very thin, huge eyes. And that horrible things were done to their bodies. A probe was put up my right nostril. I was terrified. When did the UFO phenomenon begin? Roswell, New Mexico, is still the mother of all UFO stories. But is our government telling us the truth? The Army said it was a flying saucer. Is there a cover-up of UFOs? This teenager says he's got proof. I found reports going all the way through the 1990s. And he's posting this evidence on the Internet. There's something there that the government doesn't want us to see. Does this man have an alien implant? I don't want that thing in me if I didn't give them permission to put it in. Doctors are shocked by what they find. This man's life has been a nightmare of alien abductions. Why me? And for what reason? Is his story a hint of our dark future? And for the first time on television, the most credible recent UFO sighting, recorded by over a dozen policemen. This is weird. Oh my God, I hope that's a plane. Oh, please be a plane. Oh, please. Are UFOs real? Do aliens exist? Tonight, join me as we explore one of the greatest mysteries of our time. Unidentified flying objects. Are they actually alien spacecraft? Or as many claim, events of nature and elaborate hoaxes? To discover the truth, we must examine the evidence. In the last 50 years, literally thousands of UFOs have been photographed. And recently, home video cameras have captured many more on video. Many of these UFOs are breathtaking. Others are just bizarre. Two of the more remarkable images include a controversial new video that many call a hoax, and a decades-old photograph that, to this day, no one can disprove. We begin with a look at the most recent hotspot of UFO activity. Mexico. The nation of Mexico is certainly one of the hottest areas for UFOs in the world today. And the phenomenon of the Mexico City UFOs is really a phenomenon driven by videotape. No one knows more about this phenomenon than Jaime Massan, director and host of Third Millennium, a popular TV show in Mexico that deals with the unexplained. Every week, Massan airs footage shot by his viewers with their own cameras. One type of UFO captured again and again has Massan convinced that something unearthly is going on. The first event, it happened on July 11th, 
1991, many people in different cities saw UFOs, and some of them were able to record it. And this is what they caught on video. Numerous shiny, apparently metallic disks. Some have called these UFOs the planet Venus. But that doesn't explain this phenomenon. We have these objects making a formation with more than 20, 30, 50, 100, or probably more than 100 UFOs. They get together, they separate, they make a figure here, another figure there, very difficult to explain. I don't know what they are, but they could be signs in the sky. But all of these sightings pale in comparison to video footage Masson received anonymously in 1997. A mysterious tape that would place him directly at the center of an explosive UFO controversy. They were able to record these 21 seconds of this object hovering behind the buildings. What you're seeing now is that anonymous video. We present it unedited and without any visual enhancement. The object resembles a stereotypical flying saucer. What makes the UFO so striking is its movement, darting behind these high rises, suggesting that its size is over 50 feet in diameter. But is this footage for real? I thought it was a hoax. I haven't seen anything so real, so clear, so close. And then I said, no, this is not a hoax. There has to be something incredible. The obvious question arises, were there any witnesses? Many did come forward after the footage was aired on Massan's program. Even so, Massan claims one is credible. A little girl, her name is Cassandra. She didn't see the video, and she described exactly the same thing. It was a huge object going around and around. I never seen anything like this before. It was gray and metallic. I felt very tense. Yesterday we presented a video on television. Did you see it? No. There is a group of more than 100 people who don't want to come into camera in front of the public, but they say, we saw it. If this is a hoax, it's a masterpiece. It is potentially very strong evidence of something very curious. And one has to ask, could this possibly be real? We ask that very question to renowned skeptic Philip Glass, the author of numerous articles and books on the UFO controversy, and an aggressive debunker of any purported evidence of aliens among us. Glass is not afraid to confront anyone on the subject, even Jaime Mossan. In 32 years, I have never encountered a single case that could not be explained in down-to-earth, prosaic terms. What does he think of the mysterious discs videotaped all over Mexico? These are helium-filled mylar balloons, which are sold in Mexico. They are very popular. And what about the anonymous flying saucer footage. Almost certainly, beyond any doubt in my mind, this was a hoax. When I first saw this, I said, wow, you know, maybe there's really something here, but on closer examination, it doesn't make it. Visual effects artist Dennis Muren has won eight Academy Awards for his work on such films as Star Wars and Jurassic Park. I just adjusted the contrast a bit on it to bring the contrast up and brighten the scene up a bit. And it looks like the line underneath the saucer here might be continuing on through the building. I think what we're seeing here is actually a composite. It's two separate scenes. Here, at Industrial Light and Magic, Hollywood's leading special effects company, creating a shot like this is about as easy as it gets. All you need is the right software. For example, we have a shot here that we did for a commercial. The original element of the skier looks like this, but the environment that we want to put it into is here. We have the ability to put the two together. So in the context of the UFO footage, we can put him behind the rock the way the UFO goes behind the building. We can zoom the camera to fool the eye into thinking that it was shot at one time. And we can do both at the same time to add up to the impression that it was shot and it's real, when in reality, it's, it's not real. Seeing isn't believing. Who is going to invest eight, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars 
and to produce something like this just for a joke. Actually, it wouldn't cost that much. When we were doing the Star Wars films, for example, and all the way up through the 1980s, to put, say, a flying saucer like this or a spaceship in front of the background would take, you know, two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment and uh, a dozen highly specialized, talented people who spent decades learning how to do their skill. Now, one or two people on a desktop can do that with a Mac or a PC and turn out something that looks pretty darn good. We've proven that any new video like this can easily be faked. Ironically, the most convincing evidence of a UFO may be photographs from nearly 50 years ago, a time when computers that could alter or create images were merely a fantasy. These two shots, taken in 1951, are the most widely disputed but never disproven photographic evidence of a UFO. The photographs, of course, obviously have all kinds of implications that if these photographs are real, then UFOs must be real. For a conclusive analysis of these remarkable photos, we obtained the original negatives and brought them to the Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, renowned for its definitive study of the Shroud of Turin. By using the most sophisticated computer software available on the original negatives, they were able to literally take these photos apart, piece by piece. I can come in on it and see if there's any mismatch in the grain pattern, the grain structure, anything that's an obvious tip-off as to this being a fake or some sort of darkroom trickery. The photos were taken by Paul and Evelyn Trent, a young farming couple from McMinnville, Oregon. Could they have pulled off such a convincing fraud? The Trunts were not the sort of people that you would leaped to the conclusion they were hoaxers. They had no interest in UFOs. They weren't imaginative people. They were farm people. To skeptics like Philip Class, the Trent photos would be easy to fake and are easy to explain. The photograph almost certainly shows something like a hubcap suspended from electric wires that connected the house and their garage. But the experts saw no evidence of this anywhere in the photographs. Well, there's no sign, no hint of anything suspending the object, a thread, a wire. I just don't see any threads or any wires there. If it wasn't a hubcap suspended by wires, was it simply a model thrown in the air? Not according to the analysis. In fact, the UFO itself offered the most convincing evidence. I think if it were an item very close to the camera, it would have a much darker underneath on that one photograph. Uh, there'd probably be more evidence of uh, some sort of texture, surface detail, when in fact there is not. So for that reason, I'm convinced that it is a distance away from the camera. How much of a distance? According to the Brooks Institute, it's likely that this object was thousands of feet from the camera. That calculation would make the UFO hundreds of feet in diameter. Putting the theory of a hoax further in doubt is the fact that the Trents never profited from taking these pictures. Even so, Philip Class is not convinced. Why would they do this? To achieve fame? To see if they could fool the experts? If this was, in fact, what the Trents were after, if they actually did fake these famous photos, then they somehow did a better job 50 years ago than the sophisticated computers of today. As it stands, these two famous photographs cannot be debunked by the experts, and they remain unexplained. If you think the most convincing photographic evidence of unidentified flying objects has been documented here on Earth, you may be wrong. Recently, UFOs have been analyzed from a startling new and unexpected perspective. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery. Space. We're better to look for alien craft visiting our planet. In September of 1991, the Space Shuttle Discovery captured an unidentified object on film. 
What you're seeing now is actual footage shot by NASA cameras from that shuttle mission. Watch the top of your screen. Note the object that moves from right to left. Two mysterious flashes, and it makes an immediate 135 degree turn and accelerates. This is followed by a strange streak of light, which seems to narrowly miss the unknown object. This dramatic footage has been in dispute since it was shot. I studied it extensively over maybe a two-year period at least. University of Nebraska physicist Jack Kasher worked for nearly 10 years in the research and development of a Star Wars defense system for the upper atmosphere. His quantitative analysis of the NASA footage concludes that the UFO cannot be explained as a natural phenomenon. It's clearly above the atmosphere and air glow of the Earth. It maneuvers, it changes direction, it accelerates, and so the only thing really left is spacecraft. Others think this object is simply a small ice particle floating a few feet from the shuttle. Ice particles are a common waste product of the numerous shuttles that have orbited Earth. But Kasha is convinced NASA has recorded strong evidence of a large, intelligently controlled alien space vehicle. One of the very strange things that happens is that the main object actually stops and sits there for half a second before it accelerates back up to the right. Uh, an ice particle could not do that. If they're not ice particles, you don't have too many other options. They're not space junk, they're not satellites, they're not meteors because those objects don't change direction. There's never been anything that I've uh, experienced that gave me any cause to consider that there might be other life forms. Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, has a different opinion. I mean, the sky is filled with moving objects here. Uh, do I think that they are, uh, that that is credible evidence? No way. You gotta have much more confirming evidence. That doesn't impress me very much. Not every former astronaut is a skeptical. Well, it is true that there's all sorts of things floating in space, but I don't think it should be dismissed out of hand we need to take a more careful look at this type of evidence than we might otherwise. Dr. Edgar Mitchell also walked on the moon during the Apollo 14 mission. I'm quite open to looking at evidence, looking at data that purports to uh, speak of an extraterrestrial presence or some sort of space activity we're not familiar with and analyze it critically. Perhaps we have been visited. To me, I don't see anything in the video that reflects anything about UFO. Research scientist Skeet Vaughn studies the upper atmosphere for NASA. He believes the unknown objects are common space debris or waste products, most likely from the shuttle itself. And he has a theory to explain their movement. If you look at the video very carefully, you'll notice there's a flash of light. And that flash of light is probably the thruster engine on one of the shuttles. When you have a thrust effect, the thrusting of the gases move out, and that hits the object and makes the object move also. If you're a skeptic, it's easy to brush off. But if you're open-minded and you see this, there's something weird about it. Dr. Mark Carlotto has 20 years of experience conducting digital image processing for scientific research. These were not videos taken by someone in their backyard. These are taken aboard a U.S. spacecraft, so the integrity of the data cannot be questioned. NASA's explanation is that what we're looking at here are ice particles floating around the shuttle, but when you look at it more carefully, it doesn't make sense. If it was a thruster firing, when the thruster firing occurs, the orientation of the spacecraft should change very slightly. But we don't see any change in the apparent motion of the stars. So that indicates the attitude of the shuttle has not changed from the thruster firing. Dr. Kasha believes the UFO was miles from the shuttle, well out of range from a thruster firing, and that it was moving at an incredible speed. If the object is as close as 10 miles, it went from zero to 2,500 miles an hour in one second. And that's an acceleration of more than 100 Gs, which would kill a human pilot. And the technology we're looking at is, is just quantum leaps beyond anything we have on the Earth. And what about the mysterious 
streak of light. Could it have been intentionally directed towards the unknown object? You have a streak that goes through where it had been. One thing that pops into everybody's mind is that this is some kind of a missile or weapon system. Kasha bases this theory on years of analytical comprehensive study of the video. Could the double flash of light be the firing of some kind of sophisticated weapon? And if so, from where was it fired? At the time this event took place, the shuttle was on a course over the west coast of Australia. Curiously, there is a large American military installation near Alice Springs in central Australia. And it's the largest satellite intelligence gathering facility in the world. Although there is no proof, there is speculation that a Star Wars missile defense system is operational at this site. But for Buzz Aldrin, the explanation behind this footage is far less provocative. And I think we're often fooled by uh, optical illusions. I mean, it's even a term that's quite common to most people, optical illusion. What does it mean? Well, it means that there's an illusory thing that we pick up with our eyes that we can't quite explain. Illusion or not, astronaut Mitchell believes this UFO, like others before it, deserves serious study. There have been a large number of other anomalous type phenomena that have been associated with the UFO phenomenon that are not easily dismissed. This should be looked at and we should know what that is. Although NASA insists this footage is nothing unusual. After this mission, all live satellite feeds from shuttle cameras were canceled. While the debate continues over the shuttle discovery footage, a more recent mission is causing a whole new controversy. In December of 1996, a shuttle camera recorded this bizarre image above the Earth's atmosphere. And on the same mission, these three objects were captured on video by NASA cameras. They seem to orbit directly over a thunderstorm on Earth, moving independently of each other, yet closer together. And then, there's this startling occurrence. Dr. Kasher is eager to analyze this new space shuttle footage. And these three objects are moving with respect to each other, so they're not stars. And the cameraman is interested in them too. He's gonna follow them, try to get a closer look. So we have some, some interesting, intriguing things that uh, I really don't understand. The most interesting thing to me is that little blob that seems to pop up from the clouds or whatever. It's got that little dark center and it's circular and it floats across and, and I'm just really not sure what it was. I, I would love to be able to explain what it is. I wish NASA, when interest is shown in something like this, would, would put people on it to, to investigate it thoroughly, not just to watch the video sit down and do a real rigorous job and show us the science and the calculations and try to really explain what some of these things are. Where do we come from? Why are we here? These are burning questions. This is perhaps a small step in finding out a little bit more about uh, how we fit into things. We need to make people aware that this UFO business is important and significant and worthy of study. And we need to get more mainstream scientists involved in it. I think that's very, very important. When we return, what happens in an alien abduction? A probe was put up my right nostril. And next, did a UFO crash at Roswell. The Army said it was a flying saucer. Dane's eyewitness claims of UFOs and alien beings. Whenever possible, actual footage is used to present these stories. In other cases, dramatic recreations are utilized. Some say evidence of aliens here on Earth can be found as far back as ancient Egypt. The modern UFO age, however, began with two events in 1947. The first involved a man who made flying saucers famous. The second, a town that made them legend. Kenneth Arnold was a private pilot from Boise, Idaho. 
a conservative western sort of man a man without a great deal of imagination wasn't much of a reader certainly not a science fiction fan on june 24th 1947 just before 3 p.m arnold was flying a small plane to yakima washington arnold sees nine disc-shaped objects traveling over the Cascade Mountains, flying in formation. Arnold was able, because he knew the area, to compute that they were traveling at least 1,200 miles an hour or faster. Now, there was nothing known anywhere on the globe in 1947 that could match that speed. They looked something like a, a pie plate that was cut in half with a sort of a convex triangle in the rear, a kind of weaving and going at a terrific speed. I thought, well, maybe I, something's wrong with my eyes. He described the movement of the objects as like that of saucers skipping across water. From this point on, the phrase flying saucer would forever be attached to strange, unknown objects in the sky. But Arnold's sighting was only the beginning. Within days, additional independent accounts came pouring in from around the globe. I think you can probably point to individual reports that are purely imaginary. But there were a whole lot of sightings in 1947. And all through the 1940s, 1950s, these objects showed up on radar that could be photographed. They were seen by pilots, seen by scientists, astronomers, police officers, people of impeccable training, reputation, good sense. There was something there. But why 1947? Why would beings from another world choose this particular period to visit Earth? One favorite theory was that extraterrestrials had observed nuclear explosions going on, on the Earth's surface and realized that we had come to some level of technological development where they had to pay attention to us because it would not be very long after this that we ourselves would be going out into space, which of course is what has happened. Still, the numerous sightings of 1947 might have been forgotten had it not been for what happened in a deceptively quiet corner of the American Southwest. Roswell, New Mexico, is still the mother of all UFO stories. In 1947, the Cold War was heating up, and the Roswell Army Airfield, home of the 509th Bomber Wing, was the only base in the world that had nuclear weapons. Tensions were already high when the following disputed events supposedly occurred. A disc-shaped object crashes in the nearby desert. Hearing accounts of bizarre wreckage, soldiers from the base are dispatched to the site. They are shocked to discover debris from an alien spacecraft strewn across the sandy landscape. It is quickly gathered up and stored in hangars on the base. Among the wreckage, eyewitnesses report seeing a number of alien bodies. Pilots from the mysterious craft. And one creature that still lives. From this point on, the details of the Roswell story and the explanations given by the military get murky. The United States Air Force has told four separate and distinct stories about the Roswell incident. The first story, a press release, said that the Air Force had captured a UFO. The next story came literally the next day. Oops, not a UFO. A weather balloon. It is this revisionist explanation that has led some to allege a cover-up exists at the highest levels of our government. A vast conspiracy to keep the truth of Roswell and UFOs in general from the public. Something like this is going to be swept under the rug. 
something like this, there will be disinformation put out about. Something like this will be lied about to the American people. Let's not forget, the Army said it was a flying saucer. Nowhere in my research uncovering the Roswell story did I find any evidence of any kind of conspiracy or cover-up of any kind. James McAndrew wrote the recent official government report on the Roswell incident. What was found near Roswell in July 1947 was the very first launch of an experimental project called Project Mogul. Project Mogul was a high-altitude balloon program designed to detect Soviet nuclear explosions. Launched from nearby White Sands military base, these balloons, according to the government, landed near Roswell in 1947. As for the alien bodies, McAndrew credits another military project in which new parachute designs were tested by dropping crash dummies from a high altitude. And we believe that this is what people observed, the Air Force recovering from the desert, that have now become the so-called aliens of the Roswell story. I think Roswell is, is in many ways very similar to the Kennedy assassination. No matter what you tell people, they don't accept the truth. The crash dummy project did occur, but as official documents state, not until 1954. The government believes foggy eyewitness memories have blurred the two incidents into one. It's, it's one lie followed by another. There's only one thing in the entire world that makes sense. And that is they got their hands on what probably were the remains of an E.T. craft. Although what actually happened at Roswell is in question, the subsequent effort of the United States government to study UFOs is not. Between the summer of 1947 and the end of 1952, the Air Force had collected some 3,200 UFO reports. And it concluded that approximately a quarter of them remained unexplained after investigation. They were classified as unknowns. This exhaustive investigation was conducted under the names Project Sign, Project Grudge, and ultimately Project Blue Book. In 1952, Blue Book would face its greatest challenge when a dramatic UFO incident rocked the nation's capital. Over three consecutive weekends, a cluster of low-flying yet high-speed UFOs buzzed Washington's historic monuments. All I might add in restricted airspace, these objects were witnessed. Newspapers all across the United States reported on this. Civilian and military radars in and around the Washington area were picking up these objects. Planes were scrambled, not from nearby Andrews Air Force Base, but from a farther away base. The hottest aircraft we had at that time was brought into the fray. The impact of these sightings was felt throughout the corridors of power in Washington. There were so many reports that intelligence channels got clogged up with UFO reports. In other words, if a hostile foreign power had chosen that moment to attack the United States, the message could not have gotten through to the Pentagon. This undermined our ability to respond to what the defense establishment felt was a more likely threat. Soviet nuclear missiles. Alarmed, the CIA began a full inquiry. Now, not as you might suspect, to make a determination on what UFOs were, but how do we treat this in the public? What do we do to make UFOs into a non-subject? They said, basically, our uh, principal goal on the national security level is to debunk UFOs, and they did use that term. And so it became policy to debunk UFOs. Project Blue Book was told to adopt this new skeptical agenda in spite of any evidence to the contrary. Project Blue Book's mandate was to reduce the number of unknowns to a minimum, even if 
their explanations were ridiculous. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberration. In 1969, the debunking operation largely successful, Project Blue Book was officially terminated. Blue Book uh, was stumped, absolutely stumped, on more than 700 cases. So even Blue Book, charged with getting rid of UFOs at any cost, couldn't get rid of all of them. What is the real truth about UFOs? What the Air Force was trying to slip past the public tells me that they have something just as sure as God made little green apples that they're still hiding. When we return, this teenager has found clues of a UFO conspiracy. Something is being covered up. And next, thousands being kidnapped by aliens. I was terrified, absolutely terrified. I was in a horizontal position. I could feel my back on hard surface. I felt that I was frozen. Physically, I was shut down. A probe was put up my right nostril. And I recall hearing a cracking sound. They put something in my ear. I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Whether they call themselves abductees, experiences, or contactees, these people and thousands of others just like them say they've been kidnapped by extraterrestrials. Could an alien race actually be conducting a widespread abduction program? It's a question that goes right to the heart of the UFO controversy. The impact of these experiences on the people that have them is enormous. This UFO... Harvard professor of psychiatry, Dr. John Mack, is a Pulitzer Prize winning author who has researched the abduction phenomenon. His book detailing his exhaustive study is considered a landmark work on the subject. The abduction experience changes them at every level. It changes their relationships within their families, their sense of who they are, their sense of the world that they live in. This is an enormously powerful part of their life experience. The most important aspect of these experiences that made me believe that they were events rather than something else was the fact that the stories were so similar. A typical abduction would go something like this. Uh, the person is in their bedroom. A light will come into the bedroom, an intense light. It was very bright, but it wasn't blinding. You could look into it. It had like a blue hue around it. Then they may see one or more humanoid beings around the bed. They were tall. They were very thin, huge eyes. They're paralyzed. They end up... Uh, entering uh, a UFO or some kind of a craft. And there are uh, what they call the greys with these now familiar, well-described big black eyes. There's something with the eyes that really catch the attention to the point of where looking at the rest of the physical being is not as important as paying attention to the eyes. A number of procedures are done to their bodies, which uh, may involve probing of almost every part of the, the body, uh, taking of sperm from men, eggs from women. It was very powerful and very intense and felt very vile. I felt very violated. There was a, a sense of helplessness a sense of being violated. My fists were clenched, and uh, it was not a pleasant experience. But are 
are these stories true? Or are they just well-told, imaginative lies? We're not dealing with just invention of a story. Something occurred here that triggered a set of, of emotional reactions. That's highly significant. Who knows why? I mean, who knows how this... Bud Hopkins is an abduction expert who has written a number of best-selling books on the subject. We really don't know. He conducts group therapy sessions with those who claim they're victims of these bizarre incidents. In these meetings, abductees can share their stories without fear of ridicule. I was put through a series of tests, and I thought I was going crazy. Even though what they're saying might sound crazy, they don't have the kind of behavior that crazy people have. When we do psychological testing, we find that uh, these people are essentially psychologically normal. But a common thread in these abduction stories raises doubt. Most abductees have little conscious memory of their time spent with the aliens. They do an incredibly good job of blocking your memory from recalling almost anything. And this is the most difficult obstacle to overcome. It's this aspect of the abduction experience that Hopkins has termed missing time. And he explores it through hypnosis. I'm going to count to three. Over his 30 years of studying UFOs, Hopkins has hypnotically regressed hundreds of abductees. He's convinced the truth can be found in the subconscious mind. I want to scream for my mom. Mm -hmm. But I can't. Why? Because it hurts to move. It was just all around me, and I can't move anywhere. There's no, there's no space to run. I've worked with abductees from South Africa and Saudi Arabia and Israel. Just standing there in the middle of the room, is that mm -hmm. it? I have no alternative than what the evidence suggests to me in an absolute way. It's going on. It's happening. It's real. The abduction phenomenon is is absolutely everybody. It's the good, the bad, the ugly. It goes across all uh, uh, racial divides and, and gender, of course, and cultural level. It's absolutely everybody. It appears to be completely random. A CNN Time poll has found that half of all Americans believe there are people who have experienced an alien abduction. An Europa poll has discovered that 0.3% of their sample question believe they might have been abducted by aliens. This percentage may seem small, but it could translate to over 800,000 people. Many of those studied by Bud Hopkins have one thing in common. In terms of their personalities, many of them are suffering from what we might diagnose as post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, when you get up in the morning and you have had one of these experiences, it's not like you just get up and want to make toast, you know? I mean, you, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Something happened to these people. There's no doubt about that in many, many, many cases. But not everyone agrees. What's the first thing that you sense is different? Among research psychologists, Hopkins' beliefs and methods are seriously questioned. It's the nature of hypnosis to put thoughts in someone's head that weren't there before. I'm not allowed to hide. Who doesn't allow you to hide? You put your faith in that person because you're lost and you're scared and you don't know what to do. But why can't anyone help me? That person puts you into an altered state of consciousness and together you sort of do a little dance that convinces both of you that yes, you've had this experience, you are an abductee. There is a type of person who is highly imaginative, who is easily hypnotized. They're normal, they're sane, they're not psychotic, but hypnosis is the yellow brick road to fantasy land. The big uh, false issue that has always been dragged into this argument is the issue of hypnosis. Maybe a third of the abduction accounts we get come without any hypnotic regression whatsoever. They remembered the way one remembers an automobile accident or a mugging. I remember going inside this whatever it was and um, being examined somehow. Another explanation offered by skeptics is that abductees are actually experiencing what's called a waking dream. A waking dream occurs when you're going to sleep or just waking up. Your eyes are open, but you tend to see dreamlike images. And you may feel paralyzed if you're just waking up because your body is still asleep. And it may be very vivid, uh, very colorful. 
and the person is probably actually going in and out of a dream state. And yet it seems very real. It seems as though I'm awake. In spite of the criticism, Hopkins believes the sheer number of reported abductions is impossible to ignore. There are many theories trying to attack it. But the theories don't hold water. Thousands of people are claiming that this is happening. There's a massive evidence supporting that. Now, for me, the evidence constitutes proof that this is going on. Well, I don't know that I really want to believe it's true. C.D.B. Bryan, author of the bestseller Friendly Fire, investigated the abduction phenomenon for the New Yorker magazine. It's a quite a terrifying possibility, isn't it? Uh, that some strange beings can lift you out of your bed at night and into a spacecraft and do strange medical experiments on you. With a healthy dose of skepticism, Brian attended a conference about alien abductions held at MIT in 1992. His findings, based on numerous abductee interviews, were published in his book, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. I found my skepticism diminishing to the extent that I was more open to the possibility that what some of these abductees were saying, what the researchers were saying, could possibly be true. I no longer feel that the abductees, to use a medical term, are crazy as loons. But I, I don't know what's going on. Either what's happening is a new psychological phenomenon, or it's true. Our basic argument is we've got to look into it. Investigation is essential. And I think any true scientist has to come over to our side at some point. Because you can't have a phenomenon as extraordinary as this and at the same time announce there's, there's no reason to look into it. An extraordinary phenomenon demands an extraordinary investigation. When we come back, the investigation continues with one man's terrifying abduction experience. My car was lifted off the interstate. Also, for the first time on television, Ohio police chase a giant UFO. At least 14, 15 officers said that they saw something. I've never seen anything that could compare to this. And next, see the removal of what could be an alien implant. This is an extraordinary discovery. This may look like a medical team prepping for a routine surgical procedure. But what you will see is definitely not routine. You are about to witness for the first time on network television the actual surgical removal of what some claim is an alien implant. Thousands of people worldwide believe they've been abducted by beings from another world. But one question has undermined these incredible stories. Where's the proof? Many abductees claim it's the strange foreign objects they found in their bodies. Implanted, they say, by their alien captors. Their purpose, unknown. Will the surgical removal of one of these items be the proof of aliens among us? With this procedure, we finally have the opportunity to get to the bottom of this incredible mystery. Whitley Strieber was already a successful fiction writer when he published a landmark book in 1987 about his own abduction experience. The book, Communion, triggered an unprecedented reaction around the world. I was shocked to find that thousands of others said they had experiences similar to mine. And many of them reported finding strange foreign objects in their bodies after their abductions. If these are alien implants, it's a horrifying thought. What are they for? We found one man who believes he has an implant and wants it out of his body. He wishes to be referred to only as Paul. Paul, how did you first become aware that you might have an implant? I was skiing with some friends. I took a fall. They took an x-ray of the hand, and there was a strange object next to my thumb. 
how did you feel when you found out the object was there? Well, the first thing is, is why me? I'm not a particularly extraordinary person. Why would I be tagged? I had this feeling like I was a, uh, a wild animal or a, or a piece of cattle. I don't know how it's influencing my life, my thoughts, my health. I don't want that thing in me if I didn't give them permission to put it in. The object appears to be in the thumb, and it should be a relatively simple procedure to go in, isolate it, and remove it. Los Angeles Dr. Roger Lear and his partner, UFO researcher Daryl Sims, have studied hundreds of alien implant claims. And Lear himself has removed two objects from the bodies of supposed abductees. These objects seem to be all over the body, deep inside the skull, in the brain, near the lung, uh, virtually every place you can imagine on human anatomy. We are trying to find out by a scientific method and use those principles of science to find out exactly what this phenomena is and what's going on in these individuals. So far, test results have been inconclusive, but Lear's convinced the object in Paul's hand is different and might be the evidence they're looking for. He bases this conclusion on one curious detail. Paul is an interesting case. We uh, took a physical examination of his uh, hand and arm. We looked for the telltale marks of the portal of entry. Uh, we didn't see any. There was no scar. It had to enter somewhere. It had to enter somehow. Paul has no memory of a previous injury, even as a boy. But perhaps this mystery isn't as mysterious as it seems. Now, this fragment went in along the same lines as the creases of the thumb. You, you may not have noticed it. Dr. Nazreen Babu Khan of the University of Southern California School of Medicine believes there's a more innocent explanation for the mysterious object in Paul's hand. It's very easy to forget that you've gotten a bump or that you got hurt or that you had a pencil poke you in school. A lot of people come in and they have no recollection of it. He may have not noticed that something went under his skin, and the skin may have healed over it um, very nicely, not even showing a scar. Nevertheless, Lear and Sims are convinced the other foreign objects that have been removed offer clues that suggest an intelligence was involved. The nerves that they were attached to seems to indicate that there was a procedure there done that allows whomever did this to monitor that person's uh, biological functions and even to control them. They could be tracking devices. These could be devices for monitoring a genetic change or genetic progression uh, in the body. Perhaps if they are truly implants, they are there for a purpose where we as a human being couldn't even surmise. Just what is the foreign object inside Paul's body? The only way to know for sure is to have it removed. Are you afraid of having this taken out? I am afraid of what might happen when it's being taken out. Has it been designed in a way that's going to harm me when it's removed? I don't know. Am I anxious? Am I afraid? Sure I am. Will I be relieved if it's not alien? You bet. With everything in place, the surgical team begins its work. A local anesthesia numbs Paul's hand. surgeon makes an incision, and it's time to remove the foreign object. I think it's fairly safe to say at this point that this object is certainly not similar to any of the usual objects that are removed from the human body. This is one of the most unusual objects uh, that I've seen in uh, 34 years of the medical practice.
The first step in analyzing the object was to study its surface. To do that, it was examined through a scanning electron microscope. This allowed for it to be magnified up to 500 times its actual size. The object appeared to be predominantly iron, perhaps a small fragment of a steel knife or tool. But in order to reach a more definitive conclusion, the unknown object had to be analyzed under its surface, on the inside. For that process, it was brought to the University of Texas in San Antonio. It looks like it might be an iron oxide. If we can crush it and get it to very small size, we'll be able to really get to the internal structure more readily. The object resisted crushing, but an outside layer did flake off. This was put under X-ray diffraction, and the results of this test were curious. They couldn't match it to any of the 65,000 known substances in their computer file. It's not in our file. I'm not sure what to think about that at the present time. That's as many known substances that we have on the planet as possible. According to the lab's official report, if the material analyzed is indeed iron, it lacks any internal ordered arrangement of atoms or ions. Whatever substances make up this unknown sample, it's a mystery this test couldn't solve. The combination of these elements could be put together by nature, they could have been put together by man, or they could be put together with a different type of uh, physics that uh, we have little knowledge of. This is an extraordinary discovery. Why can't it be identified? It just confirms for me that this abduction phenomenon and now implant phenomenon must be taken seriously and studied. Of course, other tests may offer a more conclusive analysis of what this unknown object may be. Until then, Paul must deal with the unexpected emotions he's felt since the object was removed. I had this experience of emptiness, sort of like a feeling like maybe a pet had died. I'm not sure how to explain it other than this sense of something missing. Coming up. Why me? For what reason? He says he's been abducted by aliens his whole life. And next, is there a UFO cover-up? There's something there that the government doesn't want us to see. The internet. Perhaps the best evidence of our fascination with the UFO phenomenon. The World Wide Web is today, uh, without a doubt, the world's largest repository of UFO information. It's only here that ufologists can find anything and everything they want to know about the mystery of Are We Alone? The UFO subject virtually dwarfs all other subjects on the internet. UFOs are the second most popular subject in terms of web traffic and number of websites uh, right behind sex. Out of the countless UFO websites, one stands out in its attempt to reveal what many believe is a concerted government effort to cover up the existence of UFOs. And it's the brainchild of a 17-year-old from Northridge, California. What he's created has made him a folk hero to the UFO community and quite a nuisance to the United States government. It's almost like a, an X-Files episode in our house. It's kind of my hidden other life that, that not many people know about. John Greenwald is the mastermind of the Black Vault, a website doggedly devoted to uncovering and unveiling once top secret government documents relating to UFOs. The Black Vault was kind of a name I thought of late at night, and really the name is exactly what it is. It's a vault of information. John's website holds over 6,000 pages that he's obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. These documents are displayed just as John gets them. With UFO information, the government doesn't want us to see blacked out. I have half pages that are blacked out, full paragraphs. But what's interesting is I'll find pages that are just completely blacked out from top to bottom. The government position is that this censorship is common in declassified documents and is necessary for national security. 
but John remains suspicious. And the list of government agencies he's contacted reads like a Washington, D.C. phone book. The Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency. There's been about 10 Air Force bases that I've gone to. NORAD, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense, FBI, lots of letters to the Pentagon, and there's different offices in the Pentagon. The headquarters for the Air Force, the United States Navy, United States National Army. Reconnaissance Office. There's been a lot. There's been a lot. She's got a dance recital. I think we're the only family in Northridge, at least, that gets calls from the FBI and the CIA, and they want to know what he wants, why he wants it. They don't realize that he's still in high school. I think they probably do get annoyed with my letters. I don't get pushy. I try and be as polite as possible in the letter. But it's tough when they tell you that there's no records on something and you feel that there is. John's internet detective work has led to dramatic discoveries that have impressed UFO conspiracy theorists around the world. The government investigated UFOs with Project Blue Book, which ended in 1969. And since then, they've stated that there's been no evidence to go into UFO sightings. But what I found with my Freedom of Information Act requests and my letters to different agencies, I found reports not ending with 1969, but going all the way through the 1990s. And the ones in the 1990s are more heavily blacked out than most of the stuff earlier in time. One of John's many targets is Ohio's Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the mythical home of captured alien bodies and spacecraft. So I sent one of my requests to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for all UFO documentation, and they sent me a letter back stating that there were no records at their office. But four or five months later, I discovered that they had almost a thousand pages at Wright-Patterson. There's something there that the government doesn't want us to see. John's website receives over 33,000 visits and 4,500 emails every month. It's this popularity that convinces him he's onto something big. Whatever is behind that veil of black, I don't know, but something is being covered up. The fans of the Black Vault can expect many more declassified documents on UFOs. And the government agencies that already know his name can expect many more letters from a Mr. John Greenwald, a young man with a lifetime of questions. And until they're answered, we can never be sure. We've seen some fascinating UFO footage, heard incredible accounts of alien abductions, and even witnessed the surgical removal of what some claim is an alien implant. If any of this is true, what does it mean? Author Whitley Strieber has found a man whose story may seem too outrageous to believe. But others say it offers a disturbing answer to the question, what is the alien agenda? While researching my books, I've personally investigated hundreds of abduction cases. But one man's story truly haunts me. His name is Jesse Long. He claims to have been abducted many times since he was a boy, and the abductions he describes are terrifying. If what Jesse tells me is true, then there is a very surprising future in store for all of us. Jesse, when do you first recall being abducted? My first abduction occurred in 1957, when I was five years old in Rogersville, Tennessee, a very small town in Upper East Tennessee. My brother John was with me at the time. Uh, above the hill behind our house, we came upon the, what appeared to be a round house under construction. And one man, a taller looking figure, he had a rod, long rod in his hand. A light was emitted from it and we were paralyzed. It is at this point that Jesse Long's conscious memory of what happened ends. He says it's only through hypnosis that he's been able to remember the rest of this first abduction. <laughs> what you are seeing is actual footage of Jesse undergoing hypnotic regression. <laughs> 
You will not be able to... I remember being taken into the craft, taken into one room. I was placed on a very cold, flat table. My brother was separated and he was taken into another room. his abductors inserted a small item, an alien implant, into his left shin. And it was in my body for 34 years. Could you feel it inside you? What did it feel like? It was always painful. I always had to wear my socks below the incision point because it was painful. In 1991, Jesse had the foreign object removed from his leg. There it is. This is actual footage of that procedure. This is the object that was in my leg. And unfortunately, during the initial test that was done on it, it was broken into two pieces. But that allowed us to look at the inside. Some have dismissed the object as simply a shard of glass. But when it was analyzed at Southwest Research Institute, a materials analysis facility in Texas, the conclusion suggested a greater mystery. According to the lab's report, the object revealed a very remarkable composition and exhibited unique surface characteristics that cannot be explained and that the questions outnumber the answers. When the object was removed, I was convinced that whatever this object was had something to do with all of my abductions. Jesse Long believes he has experienced a number of abductions since that first incident in 1957. And they became more and more horrific as he grew into an adult. Most of my abductions occurred very similarly. When they brought me into the craft, they would take me down a long hallway. They would place me on a flat table. Of course, I was paralyzed had to be because I was kicking and screaming. I didn't want to be there. The experiments on the table included a sperm extraction. The sperm extraction procedure is the most traumatic and has caused me the most problems in that they actually force me to crossbreed with what seems to be a female being. Fantasy-prone people are criticized for fantasizing, except if they fantasize that they have been abducted by a UFO, then they become a celebrity. And they will tell you a, an elaborate story, and the fantasy-prone person will actually be writhing in pain with tears streaming down his or her face as they relive some painful abduction experience that they've just imagined. And those people tend to be the people who are boundary deficit disordered. They have problems with relationships. They always say, I've always felt like an outsider. I, I don't feel like I belong. They can't hold jobs. Uh, they just have a tough time in life. And 
telling this person who's been lost and outside and alone that they do belong, that they're an abductee, that they have an identity, and that there are other people just like them answers all of those questions for them. Jesse, when you tell people about your experiences, do they believe you? You know, it's not my job to convince anybody. It's my job just to tell you what I've experienced. If you believe it, fine. If you don't believe it, I don't care. But Jesse's amazing story can apparently be corroborated. Remember John, Jesse's younger brother? He claims he too was there on that fateful day in 1957. We're inside of a dome. Mm -hmm. John's own hypnosis confirms Jesse's story. And perhaps in an effort to deal with his dark memories, John has built this house for himself in the hills near their boyhood home. This is evidence that can't be ignored. And the story just gets more and more disturbing. What Jesse says happened to him in 1990 may answer the question that hangs over every abduction account. Why is this being done? I was driving from California to New Orleans, and right outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, on I-40, my car was lifted off the interstate, up into a craft with me in the car. I was taken aboard the craft, placed on a table, I was presented with a baby was told, this is your child. What happened then? And there were nine other children standing along the wall. They all looked at me, and I could see, yes, they were mine. Each of the children who were standing along the wall walked up to me lying on the table, and they each touched my hand as they walked by and looked me straight in the eyes. And they walked on out of the room. And the message I was getting from them was, we're okay. Thank you. If you could confront your abductors, what would you say to them? If I could sit down with one of them right now, I'd ask them one question. I would want to know why me and for what reason. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming forward with these cases, not only around the United States, but around the world as well. David Jacobs based his book, The Threat, on the explosive issue of hybrids, the crossbreeding of aliens with humans. For Jacobs, stories like Jesse Long's are only the beginning. I think we are looking at a catastrophic situation. I think we are looking at a disaster. We are seeing a unified program here with these beings. A program of physiological exploitation by one species of another. And I know this sounds absolutely insane. We're looking at a colonization program in some way. television, Ohio police have a dramatic close encounter with a giant UFO. Many, there's no such thing as a credible UFO sighting. But what if the UFO is seen by policemen? That's exactly what happened in Ohio in 1994. For the first time on television, you will hear an actual police dispatch recording of a close encounter. The officers you will meet are real. The recording is real. And the drama of that night is undeniable. 
Trumbull County, Ohio, located just north of Youngstown, is a typically quiet Midwestern community. Here, big news doesn't happen very often. But all that changed on a late fall evening in 1994. Just after midnight, the normally calm 911 dispatch center began to get a flood of calls, reports of an unidentified flying object. It was just uh, one call after the other that was just incredible. Roy Ann Rudolph was the Trumbull County 911 dispatch operator who fielded most of the calls that night. How far off the ground is this? Everything from somebody who was casually stating they saw something in the air to somebody who was hysterical and, and thought that this was Armageddon. I mean, it was very strange. Okay, was it just like moving at a slow rate of speed? It wasn't a slow rate, it was a fast rate, but it was coming down. We just kind of took it for, okay, this is people being hysterical over a weather balloon, or this is people being hysterical over a plane or a helicopter. I wonder, did you have anyone call you about a, a strange plane or airplane or something in the air? To, Where? I was coming down Samson Drive. I don't know what it was. It was a flying saucer. What did it look like, ma'am? It was like a, uh, almost like an iridescent color. It was like a bluish purple. Though skeptical, Royan put the word out to the officers in the field. We were having a coffee break uh, at a local uh, donut shop, and we got a call from the 911 center that stated that uh, some residents had seen lights in the sky in the northern part of the township. Liberty Township Police Officer Steve Remner and Sergeant Toby Maloro didn't know what to think. It took a few minutes. We kind of laughed about it. Convinced it was nothing serious, Sergeant Maloro, an eight-year police veteran, headed out to investigate the sightings. I believed that I was going to see, uh, if anything, a plane was landing or a plane was low. That's what I assumed I was going to see. I thought Toby would come back with some kind of comfortable solution that we could offer these people who were upset. When I got up in the area, I, I was approached by an elderly gentleman that said that there was a huge light over his house and then moved south down the street. I proceeded down Sampson Drive, approximately a quarter mile. Sergeant Toby Maloro was about to become a part of UFO history. Everything shut off in the vehicle. I didn't understand what was going on. My car completely stopped and that's when the light hit the vehicle. I stood outside. I was a little bit dumbfounded. I didn't know what exactly it was. I had to shield my eyes. All I could see was a very intense white light. It seemed to be more intense in the center of it. I know it was huge. I've never, never seen anything that could compare to this. And the thing that was very strange was there was no sound. After 30 seconds, the object moved off, away from his patrol car. As soon as it started moving off, my, my car started to pack up and the radio kicked on. Maloro quickly began pursuit of the unknown flying object. I'm trying to put two and two together and say, what, well, what just happened here? Unable to keep up with the UFO, Maloro radioed into dispatch over police channels. 914 a radio. It's heading in a northerly. He told me in a you know very serious tone. I saw something, and I, I said, Toby, you're joking. And he came back and he said, uh, Roy, I saw something. You could see a red glow up in the sky. It was huge. This thing wasn't making no noise. This isn't funny anymore because it's getting to the point where 
Um, I don't know whether to believe him or not. Well, what was, what was, it? was it moving or was it just, yeah, it was glowing. It was moving. You could, you could see it like up in the air, glowing and getting further away from it. People are serious. They're very upset. Whatever it was, lit up, I mean, literally, if you were underneath it, you could see it would be like daylight, but red light. An object did come down at a low elevation over this area. UFO researcher Kenny Young broke the story of the Trumbull County incident. It was then observed by numerous other police officers from different agencies who were able to uh, uh, pursue the object coming from different locations. They were able to triangulate its position. At least 14, 15 officers said that they saw something and were discussing it freely on their channels. It changes colors from white to red to green. The sucker has not moved. We have multiple departments right now that have sightings on it. The sightings started to spread out to neighboring streets, to other communities were saying they were also seeing the same thing. It, it took a whole different meaning and uh, level of seriousness. We contacted the airport control tower uh, to ask them to check their radar. We have a report of some flying object in our jurisdiction. Do you know of anything that should be in our airspace this time, close to the ground? Uh, right this now, is not a prank phone call, I swear. You can call me back I, uh, to verify. Look at the radar uh, scope that uh, I go 60 miles diameter of Youngstown, and there is nothing out there. That's when I got the chill that, okay, everybody can't be making up the, the big bright light story. According to all the people I've spoken with, the FAA tower operator in the tower should have been able to see the object from his vantage point. I don't see anything out there, uh, nothing on the radar scope. Young requested the identity of the FAA tower operator through the Freedom of Information Act. His request was denied. I would like to ask him, could you visually observe something from your vantage point, 60 foot up in the air in a tower? The other officers got closer to the object. They radioed in with dramatic descriptions. They were able to discern a parachute-like appendage attached to the object. I've spoken with a number of the officers involved in this event. I've been satisfied that they are honest and they are telling me the truth. One officer even said he saw a structured object while viewing it through binoculars. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, you had so many calls coming in from different locations. Lieutenant James Baker of the Brookfield Township Police Department heard the amazing UFO reports on his radio. I wanted to see for myself what everybody was looking at. I decided to go to the old radar tower. This is the highest point in Brookville Township, and I'm told in Trumbull County. What he saw when he got to the top of the tower wasn't just one UFO. He saw three. They, they formed a sort of triangle pattern with the center light being raised up above the other two. Oddly enough, they were changing colors uh, simultaneously from red, yellow, blue, and green. All three lights would change at the same time. I got them right here. I'm looking at them. What the hell is it? They're sitting stationary. I got three of them. What do they look like? I've got four discernible colors. I got red, yellow, green, and blue. And the one just was like flashing. So if they're those planets those guys were talking about, then they're uh, planets with Christmas lights on. This is weird. Oh my God, I hope that's a plane. Oh, please be a plane. Oh, please. I see three lights changing colors, and I've heard no concrete explanation of what they are. And I certainly would welcome any explanation. And it's exactly identical to what you would expect for a, a, a bright star or planet low in the horizon. 
James McGahey is an astronomer who has investigated UFO claims for over 20 years. He believes there's an easy explanation for the Trumbull County incident. This is a classic example of scintillation. Scintillation is simply what most people recognize as stars twinkling. When the stars are low in the sky, in addition to twinkling, they will also change color. Clearly, the police officer who saw the very intense bright light very likely saw a fireball. A fireball is a very, very bright meteor that can be many times brighter than the full moon. I think the car stalling was just a coincidence, had nothing to do with this whatsoever. It, it, obviously, it had to be involved in my cruiser shutting down. There was no problem with my car because it started back up. I was told that it may have been the planet Mercury. It was not the planet Mercury. Another possible theory is that the UFO was a top-secret experimental aircraft from nearby Youngstown Air Reserve Base. There's no indication, evidence, or record of any kind that would indicate there were any experimental Department of Defense aircraft operating here. I can't, you know, speak for other people who say they may or may not have seen something. What I can talk from with authority is what happened here at the base and what our involvement was and there was apparently none if it was a plane it was some kind of new plane because i've never heard a plane that doesn't make a sound these policemen and the citizens who were looking at this are not trained observers to look at the night sky either from a standpoint of stars and planets or meteors or fireballs and they simply made a mistake they saw something spectacular it looked spectacular they equated it with something unknown, and the first thing that popped in their mind was the term UFO. And so, no, I don't question their, their sincerity. I just question the fact that they're reporting something and believing it to be something that it's not. I'm not saying what I saw was, was a, a spaceship from outer space, okay? Uh, what I'm saying is I saw an object that was not normal for this area gave off an intense light. It shut my cruiser off, including my radio. I lost contact with the 911 center, and it didn't make any noise. It's something that I've never seen before, I've never encountered before, and um, I haven't encountered it since. I do believe that they saw something. I don't believe that it was a star. There was something there. What I walked away from that night was a feeling that this was a lot bigger than just a couple people saying they saw a light in the sky and it made us think maybe a small place like Trumbull County could have something big happen occasionally too. ...that the government doesn't want us to see. At last, we may have hard evidence of aliens among us. Oh, please be a plane. Oh, please. This is evidence that can't be ignored. Now, you can own the special edition of Confirmation. Call 1-800-NBC-2634 now. You'll get the video with exclusive bonus footage, plus a free collector's t-shirt, all for only $24.95, plus shipping and handling. Skeptics and believers will continue to debate the question, are we really alone? Now, we leave it up to you to decide. As for the future, people will continue to come forward with accounts of strange lights in the night sky. And we will continue to listen. I'm Robert Dali.